for living with Bishop Dale C. Bronner. This series is entitled Laws That Bless. This is part seven uh, because I have combined some of the other laws in, that we have taught in some of the other sessions. But this is law number 10, the 10th commandment that is focusing on verse 17 of the 20th chapter uh, here. But just in brief review, hold up your finger, one finger. There's only one God. God says, thou shalt have no other God before me because there's only one God, the only wise God, one God no other God before me. Two, no two things alike. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image of any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above, the earth beneath, that's in the waters under the earth. God's unique. Nobody can duplicate him. Three, that looks like a W, doesn't it? That means watch your words. Watch your words. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. You know, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Four, remember the thumb is resting. That means remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all of thy work, but the seventh is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. Five, pull it back, honor. Honor your father and your mother. It's where we pledge our honor to those that have fed us and those that have helped us to grow and those who prayed for us and who have forgiven us and matured us and brought us to where we are and helped to contribute to the person that we have become today so we honor them that our days might be long upon the land which the Lord our God gives us. Number six, remember that's your gun, it's a six shooter, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not kill. I think everybody knows number seven, there's the bed, two people in the bed, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not commit adultery. And then law number eight, remember you're in jail, thou shalt not steal, you go to jail for stealing, thou shalt not steal. Law number nine, you've got one of your thumbs that's held back, you're hiding something, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. And then we come to law number 10, which is in verse 17, thou shalt not covet thy husband's, uh, thy, thy neighbor's house, nor his wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. Thou shalt not covet. Take all ten fingers, put them over your eyes like to see no evil because that's what coveting is all about, is about seeing stuff and wanting everything that you see. So see no evil, see no evil, so that thou shall not covet, thou shall not covet. And this is the tenth and final commandment here that we delve into today. You shall not covet, you shall not covet. This is the law of self-control. This is the law of self-control. Uh, the dictionary defines covet as to desire inordinately or without due regard uh, for the rights of others. Uh, that means that you want something at somebody else's expense when, when you covet it. Uh, uh, this, the, the, the first commandment and the tenth commandment, these are uh, the bookends of, the, of this great body of law. And they both deal with, with the intangible things our first with our relationship with the Almighty God, and then the tenth deals with our relationship with our own soul. The first commandment is a commandment against idolatry, having any other kind of God before us. But may I just tell you that even the tenth commandment, thou shalt not covet, is also a law that deals with idolatry. Covetousness is idolatry because we have idolized something else in our hearts and we want it so bad that we make that thing a God to us because it then possesses us. And we are supposed to be a God-possessed person, not demon-possessed, not thing-possessed. We are to be a God-possessed people. And so this is really a commandment also against idolatry. It's the same one that deals with covetousness, covetousness. But covetousness, it is a secret sin. It's a secret sin because uh, you can very easily look at some of the other laws and you can tell when a person has dishonored their mother or their father by the way that they talk to their mama or their daddy. You know, respect is, is, is demonstrated just in the tone in which you talk to people, the way that you look at them. You can tell by the way that somebody looks at their parent whether they respect them or not. And so you can tell whether somebody has respect. You can tell immediately if somebody has broken the law and they've killed somebody. Or you can tell if somebody immediately has stolen something 
and uh, they have broken that law. That's very clear. It's very clear when somebody has committed adultery, if you catch them in the act, you don't have to wonder what y'all doing. Uh, you know, when you catch somebody in a lie, and you know that it's not true. And uh, so that's very clear. But, but who can really prove coveting? Because that's a secret sin. It's a sin of the heart. Because that's something that you're doing on the inside. So you can be sitting there coveting, and your person right next to you won't even know that you're coveting. It's a secret sin. It's a secret sin. Uh, and sometimes it is so secretive that we even hide it from our own consciousness. But it's God nonetheless telling us, thou shall not covet. You shall not covet anything that's your neighbor's, his house, his spouse. Uh, nothing that, that belongs to them shall we covet. So uh, I would say that covetousness is the mother of all sin because it opens up the door to all other sin. Uh, you have to think about it, that if, if you covet your neighbor's spouse, then that means that you're in danger then of committing adultery with them committing adultery, remember? Uh, so we want to make sure that we, don't, that we don't do that. If you covet their possessions, then you uh, run the risk of stealing from them. And then if you steal from them, you got to lie to cover up that sin. And so uh, you can see how coveting gets us into all of these other kinds of sins. You know, uh, Adam and Eve's children, Cain and Abel, Cain slew Abel because of covetousness. Uh, he looked and saw that Abel's offering was accepted and his was rejected and he wanted what his brother had. He had an offering. He could have given the very best that he had with the right attitude. The Bible says that God had not respect unto Cain nor his offering. Let me just tell you this. If God does not respect you, he respects nothing that you try to give to him. It's about you. It's not even about his offering. The Bible says God had not respect unto Cain. Cain's attitude was not right. And if your attitude is stinky, everything that you can offer, don't even cook me a meal because an offer to me with a stinky attitude. And so... Coveting opens up the door into all other dimensions and realms of sin. Covetousness is, is a synonym for envy. And uh, envy is a little different, you know, than, than just jealousy. Envy is, and covetousness, much worse than, than jealousy. Uh, jealousy sees a, a lady that has a good husband, and, and you're jealous of their husband because uh, you want a husband like theirs. Envy or covetousness does not want a husband like yours. Envy wants your husband. They don't want a car like yours. They want your car, so they jack your car. See, they don't want one that's like yours. They want yours. That's what covetousness is. It's, it, it would be all right, you know, I mean, if you got a nice Toyota and, uh, you know, and, and then your neighbor sees your Toyota, and then the next thing you know, you see them with a the Toyota, as long as they paid for it with their money. You see, it's all right if they see something that you have and if they can afford it and go and get it, and that's, that's, that's not a sin. The sin comes when you start coveting what somebody else has, what your neighbor has, and then you go and get it. Get the thing that they have. The, you, you go and steal, that. you hotwire theirs and steal theirs. Then, then you have entered in, into sin. It's, so jealousy wants one like what you have. But envy or covetousness wants the actual one that you have. And that's what makes that one so, so wrong. Look over in, in uh, Psalm 37, because it, it tells us something I think very, very key here about the whole idea of envy or covetousness. Envy is covetousness. Those are synonyms. Psalm 37. And notice it says, do not fret yourself because of evildoers. Neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. Because you know, have you ever noticed that sometimes uh, wicked people seem to prosper? Now that they got nice houses and nice cars and stuff, because they've done cheated people and just done all kind of, you know, done all kind of immoral kind of activity and gotten money, taking advantage of people, preying on people's lust. But notice, the Bible says, don't envy them because they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. 
Don't you worry about a drug deal of this big balling and got big wads of money, huge stashes of cash, living large. You'll live large, but you won't live long. See, notice it says, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. You better make sure that you are actually uh, trying to desire the right kinds of things. It says, you're looking at somebody else, but he says, don't pay that any attention. He says, because they're going to soon, they're going to soon lose it all. They, they live big, but they don't live uh, long. It's a, it's, it's a fast ride, but it's a short ride. And, and, and to, to, to couple that, it, it says... In verse 3, Psalm 37, 3, trust in the Lord and you do good and, and uh, dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. And then it says in verse 4, delight yourself also in the Lord and then he will give you the desires of your heart. He's not going to give you your neighbor's possession, but he will give you the desires of your heart. Now that does not mean that God will give you everything that you pray for because sometimes we don't even know what we're asking for. When he says he will give you the desires of your heart, that means that God will take the desires in his heart and put them in yours. When you fall in love with God, God will make the things that he loves the things also that you love. As the more you grow to love God, the more you will love the things of God. And so God is saying, I will take my desires. If you will delight yourself in me, if you will worship me, if you will praise me, if you will seek me through my word, I will let my desires grow in you more and more and more and more. So I'm going to let my desires grow in your heart more and more. I'm going to let them just grow in that. So he's saying, I want you to keep my heart. I want you to keep me in your heart. Seek me. Seek me. Don't, don't seek my hand. Seek my face so you can know me. And, and I will fill you with my desires in your heart. And then if God gives you a desire, any God-given desire is a promise that God will meet it. See, God wouldn't put a desire in you that he's not willing also to supply. So if God put a, a desire in you to be able, for you to be able to lay your hands on the sick and see the sick recover, do you know that if God put that desire in you that God will heal through you? If you want your life, if you see yourself serving as a blessing to others, God will make you a blessing. You don't even have to ask God, bless me. Start praying the prayer, God, make me a blessing. Pray a bigger prayer. Pray an unselfish prayer. Say, God, make me a blessing. Will you just pray that with me right now? Say, God, make me a blessing. Do you know when God makes you a blessing, he's got to bless you in order for you to be able to bless others? And let me tell you this, when you fall so in love with Jesus that you begin to realize the blessing that you possess, you don't have time to be envious over anybody else's blessing because you realize, I got a blessing in me. I'm a blessing on my way somewhere to happen. And if you recognize that there is blessing in my own life, you don't have time to get jealous of anybody else's blessing. There's a blessing in you. There is an anointing that is in your life. You don't have to envy my anointing. You got your own anointing for what God has anointed you to do. Rest in your own anointing because God has anointed you to heal. He's anointed you to comfort. God's anointed you to prophesy. He's anointed you to be a blessing. He's anointed you to cook. He's anointed you to take care of children. He's anointed you to clean. God has anointed you to sing. He's anointed you to dance. He anoints you to write poetry. God will anoint you to do things that other folks can't do quite as well because they don't have your anointing. Forget about somebody else. I don't envy Bishop Jake's anointing. I rest in my anointing to do it my way. I'm going to just do it and be myself and be satisfied in Jesus and never coveting anybody else's blessing because I'm thankful that God has blessed me.